So let me get this straight here. A man burns his ass, falls over, and wins his first IndyCar race. All in the day's work for Scotty McLaughlin. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. Hey gang, welcome to episode 344 of Motorsport 101, and IndyCar is back everybody, we love to see it, yes, I was looking forward to this season underway again, and we got a very fun, very intriguing race at St. Petersburg, and a, I, I would argue a very much a surprise winner, um, although it's not from the brand you expect, although... I must admit, I think it's a bit strange that one of us is missing here in this panel at the moment. Um, what do you mean, one? <laughs> Where's well, Kale? <laughs> he, he, he's, he's busy flogging AirPod Maxes and uh, iPhone 13s. He'll be back next week. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, For me, first and foremost, is Mr. Ryan Eric King. Hello, sir. How's it going over there? Going, going pretty well. Uh... I currently like my job, so I can't say anything about the current situation on 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 the record. But uh, <clears throat> best best of luck, solidarity to those out there. You know who you are. Yeah, yeah. I'll say it on King's behalf um, to the union out there. We back you. Get your bread. Get your bread. We stand with you um, out there. So um, yeah, King's being polite because he has to be. I don't have to. It's great. Um, <laughs> Because if you ever get kids, Jim is a herb. Anyway, meanwhile, um, as I mentioned, Cam is too busy flogging iPhones. Where's the other co-host we normally have here? Because all I see is an empty chair. Um, RJ, you there? <laughs> Holy smokes, it is Indy Car Season review time. I am so happy. <laughs> oh, I meant to do that. I meant to do that. RJ has fallen over. Oh, <laughs> um. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. See. He went to the chair and he missed. Um. It's a. It's a. It's a common problem to have. Um. <laughs> hang on. He, he's slowly climbing back into his chair. He. he he's going to try and salvage it. There you we go. That. You didn't see that. That was. That was not me, folks. Uh. Hey, everyone. Wow. Great Andy Car season opener. Yeah, what well, well, wasn't it? And uh, how's your ass feeling? <laughs> um, it's uh, it's feeling really sore, really hot. <laughs> um, um, to uh, to alleviate the pain, I'm gonna go drink something out of a shoe. <laughs> totally normal. Welcome to motorsport. Who keeps endorsing these shoeies? God, <laughs> oh, 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 please, people. I, I need to make a public service announcement one day on this podcast to please. Stop drinking out of your shoes. It's just gross, okay? There is nothing that will convince me that this is not gross, okay? <laughs> but here we are. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about IndyCar in St. Petersburg, Florida. Florida. Don't, don't, don't forget that. It was, we, had a, we had a fun time. We had McLaughlin taking the win. We had we had a surprise comeback from Alex Polo. We had some blue flag drama and uh, our old friend and ours, Uncle Will, having a good old vent about that after the race. We'll be talking a little bit about that. We'll be talking about some of the surprises that come along and, again, the race in general and see how we go. But in the meantime, there's some places you can find us real quick. We're on YouTube and Facebook.com forward slash Motorsport 101. We're on Twitter, Motorsport underscore 101. For the final person handles are on the screen right now. And if, 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 you know, if you're listening in, that's at Harrison101HD. That's RJ O'Connell at Ryan Eric King. And Cam, who normally is here, I'll give him a plug. It's at CBuckley917. Follow him on there. He's he's normally here. He'll be back next week, I promise. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, also uh, we've got our website, motorsport 101com Com, and that's all all our details are including our patreon uh where you can back us financially on there if you really really like us all of that and much more on there as well look at the instagram as well most one on pod there you go there's rj showing that off yeah lovely stuff uh it's we, we do love channel to see tell your <laughs> friends tell your friends how much you love this podcast yeah, yeah. Tell us, tell your friends. Spread the word. Drop it in discords. Be, be a nuisance. That's all I. That's all I say. We shall be heard one way or another. Um, but yes, do all of that good stuff. Much appreciated. Right. Without further ado, let's get into IndyCar, St. Pete. 
Well, 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 gentlemen, who who get who saw this one coming to start off the year on Friday? <laughs> Scott McLaughlin takes his first IndyCar win. Um, almost out of nowhere, it was it was again a bit of a rough and tumble season for him last year. We had we had he ended up taking a, 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 a win from pole. The pole enough was a bit of a surprise. We were all a little bit in shock when we were watching that along and. He would go on to win the race in the end, narrowly holding off Alex Polo at the end. And whew, that, that, the way we got here with McLaughlin, it feels like there were some genuine question marks about his form going forward. Penske was just downsized from four cars to three. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I knew you had to sneak that one in there, RJ. That's one for you YouTube fans out there. You'll see what I mean. Um, but uh, yeah, so... We've had a, he's had a bit of a rough and tumble time in, in IndyCar, probably a bit more well known for his oval form than his uh, road and street track form, as well as a downsize in Penske. He's probably accidentally put a bit of pressure on him. But gentlemen, with all of that in mind, and now McLaughlin getting his first win at the start of his, his second full season, was this the vindication for you know the the faith that the Penske crew was put in him going forward in that number three car? So. I don't know if this is going to be the start of a championship run for McLaughlin. But what I do think is that this is proof of concept that this move works and that Penske were right to keep their faith in him. And he said as much, said himself as much after the race. He's not the sort of driver that wants to be grateful and happy to just come away with a top 15 finish every weekend. That's not how he operates. If you saw him in supercars, that wasn't how he operates. When, you don't operate like that when you win three titles, 56 races. And, you know, honestly, with the way, and, and it wasn't like a terrible season. There were certainly flashes of the potential that was there, but you know, it was not a good year by his standards and it certainly wasn't a good year by Penske's standards. I wouldn't have blamed him if at the end of that season, if he just decided to cut his losses, head back to race in Australia and New Zealand after a year. Remember, he hasn't seen his family at home since January, 2020, before yeah. the pandemic became a bad, this kind of reach. And, you know, thinking about it, he could have easily just, Stayed in supercars, stayed in his comfort zone. He could easily take down all those all-time records that is out there. But there was a reason why we were initially excited for him when he announced he was coming over to IndyCar. Because not only was it because it was a chance for a driver to come in from an unconventional background as a seat, because remember, he's not a European single-seater guy. He's not a road to Indy prodigy. He has a grand total of one season in single-seaters prior to this, and that was a Formula Ford's. Back when he was a back when he was a teenager, it wasn't just because of that, but because we knew we knew back then that McLaughlin was a different dude, and we don't even follow supercars that regularly. I mean, do you know how much of a chad you have to be to have an award at our show named for you, and you're not even an F1, a MotoGP, or an IndyCar guy? Do you realize how cool that is? Do you realize how cool you have to be, how good you have to be to do that? So. I'm so happy that Scott McLaughlin took that big step forward this weekend. I mean, look at look at the stats of this race. All last year he led five laps. This year he almost led this race he almost led fifty. I must admit, I was one that was a bit more cynical about Scott than most. Um and yeah, that rookie of the that rookie season he had it was okay. It wasn't amazing. Again, like I, I was impressed at how well he adapted to ovals. I mean, Texas, where he finished second last year, was just his fourth ever run in an IndyCar ever, and he finished second. That was mad impressive. I think his 500 was better than the performance actually showed on the on the stat sheet. Um, certainly, I without think, a doubt, he was consistently the fastest Petsky driver for per like the entirety of the month of May up until he made a pit lane error and it. And hey, it was still good enough to win him Rookie of the Year by inertia because there was only one other driver that was competing with him for it. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell Cam that, or he might just burst through my door and then uh, stab me because I didn't mention Simon Pagano back there. But um, the funny thing is, the one that jumps off the page to me was that the bookies had him at 60-1 to 1 to win this race on Friday before we'd even saw a, a wheel turned in anger. And he was probably 60-1 to 1 for good reason because he only had two finishes in the top 10 last season that weren't on ovals. And they were eighth and ninth 
in uh, in, in, in Portland. Um, so they, they weren't like I, I was a bit more cynical about this project. I thought they're going down to three cars. You've just let Simon Pagano walk, who was one you everything you can win in IndyCar. Um, as a team, you know, as, as a driver individually on a team, I thought, well, hang on, McLaughlin's going to have to be pretty good now if they've come down to three and he's the one you kept. Um, so for him to, to come back, how he came back was the, the, the improvement. Uh, what the hell was he doing in the off season? Because that was a different McLaughlin. That was a guy that had basically just ran laps in the simulator for the last half hour because I uh, lost like half season because this was ridiculous the outright pace to qualify from pole the he race never gave up the net lead in the race yeah he never gave up the net lead that was always all the contenders were behind him he was in pretty much complete control of that race and that is something that i would never have expected to see from mclaughlin going into this season so Fair play to him. I don't know what he did in the off season, but whatever it is, it's worked because this was a different McLaughlin, and I was mad impressed. What, what did you make of it, King? Yeah, like uh, I was always of the mind that this was going to be a long term project. That this was something that both mm. both McLaughlin and Penske were committed to. This being a multi year project. Uh, I didn't. Mm. I I knew Scott was going to improve in his second season. I didn't think he was going to get a race win in the first race of his second season. <laughs> and right. it is, obviously, he's very dedicated to this, and it shows on track. But I, I think it's both a combination of McLaughlin, you know, second year track he's driven at three times. Uh, mm. And... Penske overall, they've improved on last season after it being not bad but lackluster, and mm. I, I I think it, this is just like I don't think he's gonna be you know dominating the season, but this is this shows what we can expect from Scott McLaughlin going forward this season. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. I mean, you you refer to it in our notes as Jimmy Johnson, but young. And I think that now I think about it more, I'm like, that actually makes a lot more sense because there's been criticisms of the Johnson time in IndyCar as well. But then you realize a good chunk of that is probably just mismarketing for the most part, where it's like, People just assumed Johnson was going to walk in and just beat people, and that's just not how this is. That's not how IndyCar is as a series. It's way too competitive for that. It's a completely different skill set. But yeah, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think McLaughlin, like Grosjean, who we praised a lot for it last year, was you know totally committed to this. Moved his entire family out to the US, based himself over there. Um, you know. Again, I did not realize until they mentioned it on the commentary brief that he had not even seen his family for two years. That that can't have been easy, um, to say the least. Um, yeah, he hadn't even seen anybody from Australia in like about eighteen months. Like he was telling a story about he found some dude from Australia uh, while he was just walking around the track. And like you're the first Australian I've seen since like October two thousand twenty. He is way way out of his old comfort zone. Yeah. And that goes to his driving as well. Like he had to relearn like how to attack street circuits because in a supercar, you scrape a mirror off, you're fine. But if you scrape the wall like this in an Indy car, especially coming out of turn nine, oh. you're breaking a toe link. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's very, like, it's not like supercars, but there's a margin of error when it, like in Indy car, especially on the track. We saw it on Friday. Alex Pelot put it in the wall in practice. Um, you know, we saw it in the race. David Malukas brushed the marbles and that was the end of his race. And yeah, it's, it's ruthless in IndyCar. A bit more, I don't want to say this to denounce supercars in any way. It's a totally different skill set, but the margin of error is a lot smaller in this series, especially on this track. Um, yeah, that was a remarkable performance from Scotty. I did not see that coming. I mean, I, I like, I describe it a bit like an all-star game of what could possibly be thrown at you to stop you from winning a race. You had Alex Polo come from 10th to 2nd. 
you had Scott Dixon on an alternate strategy, which everybody was like, "Uh oh, <laughs> this is Scott Dixon." <laughs> Completely understandably, we we're like, "Oh, hang on a minute, you know, this Dixon, he, he, he was on a free stopper, didn't quite work out." You had Will Power, who's qualified here on pole nine times. Um, you know, amazingly, only converted one of them into a win. That's just Will Power for you. But, but he, he was competitive in the entire race himself. And he had back marker traffic to deal with, which we'll get to in a minute. You, f- they, they threw every IndyCar trait you could at McLaughlin to not have him win, and he still won. Um, that's no matter which way you slice it. That's in- incredibly impressive. Um, it was worth the pratfall at the end. <laughs> it really was. Uh, you, you can't do much better than holding off the reigning series champion in a nail-biting last few laps chase to win your first IndyCar race. Mm. And yeah, it's it's indicative of a huge step forward. I'm not going to say he's a championship contender just yet. I need to see more of this, mm. but it's a good start. It's a, it's a very, well, it's a perfect start. We got every bonus point on the table alongside the win. Pole, win, let a lap, med most laps, ticks every box. Can't, you know, you can't argue with perfection. Um, speaking of which, to, to get to that point, there was some vocal complaints, and it's a good, it is a good old-fashioned indie car topic that's come up every once in a while. This comes up almost once a year, and it came up from F1's favorite grumpy uncle, Will Power. Happy birthday, by the way, Will. He's forty-one today, which caught me by surprise. I'm like, wait, Will Power's forty-one now? Shit. Um, <laughs> time flies. So. He was interviewed after the race, and there was apparently some barbs between him and Alex Polo, who wasn't the best fan of it either, but it was done mostly in a jokey way, but it did come up again. He talked about the blue flag situation after the race, and um, because McLaughlin was held up towards the end by Tatiana Calderon, Jimmy Johnson, who Johnson was probably a bit more on purpose, given, you know, Polo was behind him, and Devlin DeFrancesco as well. They were all fighting to stay on the lead lap of the race. Power said, and I quote, every single driver in that meeting, except maybe one or two, said we should enforce the blue flag when you're coming around to lap the back of the field. We should do something about it. It would be really great if, if they did that on the lap that they were meant to, not when you have to be down a lap from the whole field. It's kind of ridiculous. At that point, it's the end of the day for that guy, and they usually let you go anyway. It's more the guys at the back of the train trying to stay on the lead lap. I think they're trying to work it out. I think they want to do that. I just don't know whether they have the ability yet with the system. So, gentlemen, I ask you, with that in mind, is it time IndyCar changes its stance on their blue flag policy? You know, for what it's worth, I thought that the post-race press conference pop-off that Will had was pretty funny, if only because, like, you have Polo sitting right next to him, who's dealt with all the same stuff and Pelot's just giving him shit the whole time <laughs> it's great i have the utmost respect for what bill does i think he's a first ballot hall of fame caliber driver i think people give him a hard time because it comes across as a grumpy malcontent uh but this one i can't necessarily agree with i i kind of like that you can race to stay on the lead lap because all it takes is one caution and you're back with the leaders and you have a chance to advance your position much further. I definitely get the idea that elsewhere you you are not encouraged to try and stay on the lead lap, but it's the way it is. And other than that, I'm not sure what else they could have done to alleviate this issue because there's a whole section at this St. Petersburg track for turn four to turn nine. It's a one lane bottleneck. You, you can't widen that out. Uh, you also had the series making a, a very subtle change in the push to pass rules where if you're already a lap down or more, they can just shut it off for you. I don't know what else is out there other than just telling everybody, listen, you can't fight anymore to stay on the lead lap. You, you got to move over. And I don't really think it should come to that because I trust that these IndyCar drivers can still race to stay on the lead lap without maliciously ruining other drivers' races in the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I think if it's an unwritten rule that, you know, you should move over for drivers who are on the lead lap, and you drivers expect, you know, the back markers to move over for them, it should just be a written rule. Like, I understand if it's 
uh, why they don't make it a rule on, say, ovals or road courses, but maybe it should become a written rule on the street courses where it's most difficult to pass people. Yeah, um, I can see the argument for that, certainly. Look, I'm generally pretty indifferent on this rule. I, I don't have like a strong opinion one way or the other. I've understood from my limited time compared to other people watching IndyCar that there is a huge amount of importance of fighting to stay on the lead lap. I completely get that. All it takes is a caution, and you could be back in the running depending on circumstances. I completely get that. I also understand that it sometimes can be completely unfair that sometimes McLaughlin can get caught behind a back marker halfway through a lap and it's cost him two or three seconds because of the dirty air and the fact that you've got an uncompetitive car in front of you. Um, you know, I can I can hear the argument either way. Um, I, I mean, you're, I think King's right to a degree that if if it really is, according to Will, an unwritten rule, like he said in the press conference, if, if it's almost unanimous amongst the drivers that they have a gentleman's agreement that they'll move over to one side if a car's a lap down, just change the rule book at that point because that's what the expectation is. And if that's what the expectation is and then people don't do it, you're going to have power pop off in the press conferences because understandably he said, well, I thought we all said in the driver's meeting we were going to move over. <laughs> it's it's gamesmanship. And, I'm, and I don't... I don't like the spirit. I don't like this spirit of the rules nonsense that often comes up in sport like this and cricket, for example, where it's like, oh well, you don't, you don't, you don't run a guy out of the other end, but you can if you want, you know, but you just choose not to. Well, it's nonsense. It's like it's either in the rules or it isn't. Um, make a choice, and I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, I, I think it's a bit silly at this point. I, I again, I think the rule is fine personally overall, but. I think I think King's right to a degree that I think on street circuits it's definitely the one with the biggest the biggest handicap if you get caught behind a slow car. On ovals you just get out of the way. You know, on road courses it's, it's a lot easier for, for guys to get out of the way and slow down. I know St. Pete's a bit unique like that as well, which doesn't exactly help. But uh, yeah, so I won't tell Will Power that handshake agreements don't mean anything in this sport, <laughs> or in most sports. Um, <laughs> bless his heart. Um, <laughs> I know he's a good boy deep now. Bless him. He wants to be a comedian. He wants to be a stand-up comedian like his brother, and I think that's going to be his next route. Just <laughs> yeah, just well, as long as you don't go into like the whole like you know, like edgy comedian route of I'm being silenced when I still get a platform on fucking everything. Yeah, I, think I think you're all good. good. I, somehow I don't think that'll be a worry. I hope. Um, <laughs> so new season, new first race in the books. Um, IndyCar often throws up many surprises. I don't think this one was any different. Uh, over the course of the weekend, fellas, what leapt off the page to you? Now, I'm going to go to King first here because I think he's going to have a little bit of stunting um, because uh, I think there's one man he wants to mention. Go on, King. Have your moment. <laughs> Do I have to go first? Well, I, I think all of us were a bit surprised when in his first IndyCar qualifying session, one Kyle Kirkwood got his AJ Foyt car into the, into the next round of qualifying. <laughs> I, I must admit this 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 was impressive um uh i i i i find it what what a little, a little story for you guys in real time as i was watching that indycar qualifying session um i got a dm from someone who i know works within indycar and works within honda who mentioned the video we made on Kyle Kirkwood and was like, I shouldn't root for this because I'm a Honda employee, but hell yeah, King Kirkwood. And I was like, yeah, can't even argue with that. It's brilliant. Um, I, yeah, I, I, look, I didn't know much about Kyle Kirkwood before the end of last year because I don't follow the American road to indie scene as much as some of, my, some of my cohorts do here. That was mad impressive. Um, if, Everything we knew about Kirkwood may be true. Um, maybe, because uh, maybe. Foyt weren't great. 
Maybe. Just look, I'm, I'm pumping, I'm easing this yeah. in a little bit. Let's, Go on, let's, <laughs> let's look at the facts here. He was the only rookie that made the, mm -hmm. the second round of qualifying. He looked like he'd done this for years already. I know the end result wasn't. It, you know, certainly it helps when you have a guy like Sebastian Bourdais as a race strategist, who, by the way, could still go out there and wheel those cars around himself. I think given how down we've been about the team and about the prospect of A.J. Foyt leaving the keys to a 23-year-old rookie, even one that's done as much as Kirkwood is, I think there's half a chance that he could Actually, King, you might be right. He might be working the year by the time this season's over. You never know. You never know. I mean, that was that was uh, that was one of the big surprises. I mean, obviously the big surprise, McLaughlin. Then there's Kirkwood. I'm glad that Renus VK has shown up again. Uh, that was his best result since his training injury last June. Uh, he worked a three stop strategy back to a two stop strategy and almost got away with a top five finish at the end. And and Dre, uh, that might not Kirk, as good as Kirkwood is, that might have not have been the most surprising performance from a Ford driver all weekend. <laughs> Honestly, I almost spat out my chocolate milkshake when the timing sheet came up in round one and it said Kellett's fifty nine point nine in P seven, and I'm like, wait, where the hell did yeah, that come I from? I, I, I <laughs> felt like I took <laughs> critical was... damage when I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I get shot out of a cannon. Like, well, like, where the hell did Dalton Kellett pull the lap of his life out of to get to do a 59.9 in that car? As fast as anything Foyt had done that weekend, because Kogan was actually amazingly slower in round two than he was in round one when he got into round two in the first place. But Kellett was only a tenth of a second away from knocking out the reigning champion, Alex Polo, who was on the bubble in sixth in that round. Um, maybe there is hope for the reigning participation trophy holder um, that's out there because that was like, that was almost drink spitting worthy. That was ridiculous from Kellett. Fun surprise that was in, in round one of qualifying. I know you also wanted to mention him as well, RJ, but Takuma Sato, uh. would you believe he's 45 years old? Uh, yeah, I don't know when or if he's going to hit the cliff because nothing good <laughs> this could last. But Takoma Sato had a pretty anonymous weekend. Hell, the coin cars had a fairly anonymous weekend by their expectations. I mean, this is the team that had that had Romain Grosjean last year. Takuma Sato's most noteworthy moment this weekend was getting rammed into by Romain Grosjean mm. at the end of second practice. He went from 22nd on the grid to finishing 10th. I, I don't know how he pulled it off, but that was an amazing drive. Those are the good surprises. I mean, we could talk about the bad surprises, like what, what the hell was that McLaren? What the hell was that Meyer Shank? And I know that was kind of inflicted <laughs> by McLaren. Pat O'Ward's opening lap was the best thing that happened to McLaren all weekend. It was the worst thing that happened to Simon mm. Pagano's weekend. Uh, but yeah, they, they've got to get it together. It's never a good sign when my email inbox has got a very strongly passive-aggressive worded email about Pagano's first weekend with the team finishing in 15th. Um, Joseph Newgarden, where the hell were you at in all weekend? I picked you for the title and you're finishing in 16th. Oh, it's, it's, uh, RJ, get your mans. Get your mans. Or one out for Alexander Rossi has a top. Alexander Rossi has a top ten finish in the bag, and then a twenty second pit stop. Under green, right there's a Brian finish. Barnhart as well because he's, he's he's new race strategist. I'm just like, oh, this is going well. And David Malukas, who was two of our podcast picks for Rookie of the Year, had a rough one. Uh, demoted in qualifying for blocking, and then binned it during the race. Damn it. <laughs> Ugh, not so great on that one, unfortunately. Yeah. Why can't I have a decent pick on this podcast? It's all going badly for me no, this no, year. No, no, no. Like, like, I've picked Malukas, I've picked New Garden, I've picked Mitch Everton. That, that was my strat, that was my strat of the season. <laughs> That was my strat of the season preview. Just big up, just big up, uh, Coyne and Malukas, and then swerve you, pick and pick Kirkwood, leave you Malukas. <laughs> is, this, is this how I just. 
Is, is, is this how Manchester boy, City yeah. view their transfers? It's like, we'll think we're going to have Harry Maguire and then we'll convince United to sign him instead. That's exactly what King's doing. He works for Man City. He's a traitor. <laughs> that, that explains everything. <laughs> like, I am pissed. That is a that is a huge breaking sports oh. story happening here on Motorsport. I'll, 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 I'll commit an investigation to King's treason after the recording, but... Gentlemen, before we get out of here, what did you make of, of this race as a whole then? Because I thought it was pretty good. I liked it. I found the tactical battle that unfolded with all the different strategies. It was looking like it was going to be a two-stop race. But then you saw guys that pitted off sequence very early on. You think maybe they could make it work. And ultimately it didn't. But the fact that the idea was there was very fascinating. And, of course, the chase for the win at the end was really fun. Uh, some fun stuff happening in the road mm. as well that was in action. Miles Rowe got a win Love in that. USF 2000. Love to see that. Ernie Francis Jr. fought his way from the oh, back Lord. of the grid to finish in the top half of the Indian Lights field. And Matthew Brabham. His first win in eight years a after his teammates Christian Rasmussen and Hunter McElray each had the race in the bag. McElray crashes from the lead. Rasmussen runs out of fuel with a lap and a half to go. <laughs> it's so crazy. Matthew Brabham should have never fallen off the single-seater ladder to begin with, but I'm glad he's Look, got another I, chance I, now. First of all, I didn't realize that Brabham was racing stadium super trucks in between now and coming back to Indy Light. So... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I did, because I, like, I saw word, it in that, action. That, that, like, how did you end up here? Um, but, like, it's funny, because every every one of the junior guys that was talking about Indy Light said, guys, it's going to be close on fuel. And then we saw Christian Rasmussen run out of fuel a lap and a half from the end, and everyone was just in shock. I was like, oh, no! What, like, what happens when there are multiple yellows and you're still a lap and a half out? Something's gone badly wrong in that camp, but no, I enjoyed this. I'm, I'm like, I'm glad that this was a bit of different from the standard indie car rough and tumble. It was an intriguing tactical race. I really enjoyed it. As mentioned, we didn't really know what was going to happen until about 20 to go when it, we, we did the maths and worked out that maybe Dixon's free stopper wasn't going to work. Um, but he still got himself back into play by doing that. And then we realized, yeah, it really is McLaughlin versus Polo, who just came out of nowhere. It's like, how the hell did Polo suddenly get to second? He just keeps doing this. It's ridiculous. It's like every time you think Polo's having a mediocre day, oh, he's second. Uh, okay, this, this is just what he's doing now, I see. Uh, and good to see power back up the front end of it. You can't go wrong with a race. Like, as I mentioned earlier, you had just about every... Every fan favorite indie car hurdle come up along the way, and McLaughlin still won, and that's and that was great. A great yeah, time. I am what about you, pretty Kenny? much in the camp where, yeah, pretty much this race was a good preview for the uh, season to come. We we got to see, uh, you know, all the teams get some time out in front and really show that they have the pace to win races. You know, besides you know McLaughlin winning the race and uh, Power, pretty much you know, really good chance at second for most of the race. Uh, we had Ganassi with Dixon, who let off sequence for a time, and uh, Polo, who was in the fight for the win. Uh, McLaren obviously had Patricio Ward right behind Dixon for a while. Most of the front-running teams got to show that they had the pace to win races today. Well, on, on Sunday. And it really shows that, there are a lot of there are a lot of teams and a lot of drivers who could win races this year. It's not going to be just one guy, you know, winning the majority of the races for the season. It's a good sign. If, if, if I mean, it, 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 it leads perfectly from last year, where the champion only won three rounds. Nobody won more than three rounds in IndyCar last year, and despite that, Polo ended up as champion. So, if it looks like it could be another year where we just don't know what's going to happen going in. And that, isn't that wonderful? Isn't it nice? It's like, you bet that to the other more European four-wheeled series where you know it's either going to be silver or purple that's going to be winning. It's actually nice where we have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, and look, McLaughlin won this race from pole position. 16-1 to 1 at the start of the weekend. If that isn't a walk-in example of the brilliance of IndyCar at times, then I don't know what is. 
quite frankly. So that was a really fun weekend. IndyCar is back on March 20th for the Expel 375 from Texas. Uh, is that J? Is that is that JP Wattall back still there? Oh goodness, we get to we get to have a gamble. I, I love I, I love this. We've had a great season opener, and now we get to uh, guess whether or not Texas is either going to be watchable or just is that Tom Max still there? Dangerous. I think it is, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, NASCAR. Yeah, the NASCAR. Yeah, yeah. All these tracks are built for NASCAR. If it, if it was anything like last year, then this might be a bit of a grind. We'll see what happens on March twentieth in Texas uh, for the Expo three seventy five. We'll check that out next week on the show. We'll be previewing the big one, Formula One season preview time. <laughs> May the good Lord help us all. Uh, places you can find us one more time until then. YouTube, Facebook.com forward slash Motorsport 101. Twitter, Motorsport underscore 101. At Harrison 101 HD. At RJ O'Connor. At Ryan Eric King. At C Buckley 917. Instagram, Motorsport 101 pod. Patreon.com forward slash Motorsport 101. And all of those details, if you extended thoughts from me on that race, on IndyCar's race itself, on the website, Motorsport101.com. Check out the blog section for more on me. That is a uh, full review of the races up there, as well as some our stray forts of february as well but until then we'll see you for the f1 season preview what's the worst that could possibly happen there either until then i'll be dre harrison they've been rj o'connor and ryan eric king sayonara everybody what and later y'all how much do we need to get rid of that tarmac yeah. <laughs> <laughs>